So today I want to talk a bit about uh, malloc for everyone, and uh, I will explain what I mean by that. Um, and it's not exactly only malloc, but uh, first I want to go over, uh, you know, just stating some fact about two D computings and what we're seeing overall in the market. Um, so you know, for a long time we've been looking at jobs on 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 our servers that are just been kind of a boring accounting job. You know, we had web server, we have the database, we had like. Uh, you know things that are really uh, uh, kind of boring, if you if you will. But um, in the last few years, we have seen a, a really uh, kind of an, uh, a spread of uh, various new workloads that are highly parallel. For instance, uh, EI, uh, all uh, all the thing you can see with model training, model execution, um, and they all you know they all build on top of multiple other kind of 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 computation, we can see, for instance, image processing and recognition and all that. Um, and all this kind of new workload, they really, really have a, a massively parallel kind of uh, properties to them, to them. And what we see is that uh, the CPU is not really that good at actually executing this kind of workload. And we see GPU, FPGA, or DSP uh, being like up to 100 times faster actually at crunching over of this kind of workload. Uh, it's very obvious on image processing and a bunch of more uh, uh, mathematical stuff like uh, fast Fourier and all that. So we've seen this change of, of, of workload. We kind of expect everybody to run and more and more people are doing this kind of workload basically across the board um, for many reasons. Um, another thing I want to point out is that we see an, uh, a really increase inside the program maturity and you know people are starting to build their program as blocks so you know they're gonna use these blocks from these people that does that thing and they're gonna use this other block from some of the folks that does these other things and then they're gonna mix and match a bunch of different blocks that coming from different people and then coming from different projects and so on and so forth I think we have all seen how people use github to uh, mix and match of various library and various uh, 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 building blocks. And so you, you see much more, you, you know, you see programs that are not fully done by only a team of programmer, but programs that is just actually an integration of multiple other blocks, building blocks that have been done by multiple other people. Um, and another thing we also see is like uh, the, the program pipeline, and it used to be your program is just taking this kind of input, is giving you this kind of output. But we now see much more people doing, uh, having programs that are actually much more versatile and people, the user, the end user can actually say, hey, I want to do that computation with that thing and, and that other thing. So, you know, people kind of build a computation graph on, on the go and it's under the control of, of the end users. Another thing also is that we see that the input data set is not only coming from the disk, local disk, but it can come from networks and it can come from sensors, it can come from various other places. So, you know, it, it used to be that the data that we're getting as input inside your program was coming from a very boring just a file on the disk, but it's, it's really much more diverse now. Um, and the key point to that, basically what I want to get at really is that the programmers, the, the people that are doing your program, they no longer control all the code that, that they are using. You know, they just take that library on GitHub, they take this old library over, and they take this building block there, and they, they, they mix and match different things from different places and from different people, and even sometimes from different languages. So you know, you have like, yeah, uh, this, this part of our program is actually Python, and this part is actually C++, and this part is C, and whatnot. So you know, you see this mix and match of various things across the board, and it does mean that, you know, people don't have uh, overall control of, over what every block is doing. You know, they don't, they, they cannot, fix or change every single box. What they want is to use blocks and be able to mix and match different blocks. So <coughs> the point to that is that the everything processor does or GPU or FPG does, it's really working on data really. And when you look at it, I, I was already mentioning that the data is coming from various sources nowadays, you know, networks, to sensors. Um, and one of the issue when you when you have that is if you're using multiple device, a CPU and GPU and whatnot, if every time you have to pass that around, you have to you go through the CPU, uh, it's kind of a bottleneck really because you know the CPU is kind of a middleman. Hey, I'm getting this data from the network. The CPU is doing some processing. For instance, the packet processing is, is uh, decapitating the data from the packets and then 
copying the data inside some memory buffer and then the memory buffer get copied again inside the, inside the GPU, for instance. And so you have like, you know, this, all these steps going one after the others and the CPU is just a bottleneck because the CPU is just glorify, hey, I'm getting data here and I'm just giving it over to this other guy. And so um, obviously it's kind, of a, it's kind of a waste and not something we want to, uh, it's something we want to address basically. Um, Another thing is also that you have, you have an interleave of, of things. So, you know, you can start doing some computation on your CPU. So let's say you do something that is really prone to be done on CPU, and then you do some other uh, algorithm that is highly parallel, and then you do it on GPU, and you take the output of that, and then you do something else on the CPU, and then you do something else, and it goes on an FPGA, and then so on and so forth. So, you know, you, you, you're moving your, comp your computation pipeline is going from one device to the next and, and so on and so forth. And so, again, if every time you have to go from, from, let's say you want to go to a GPU to an FPGA, and if you have to go through the CPU in between, it's kind of bottleneck. So, you know, if you have the CPU at the center of, of everything, you have like the CPU sitting as a, as a middleman and as a bottleneck <coughs> to everybody. Um, so that's really, you know, I like CPU, obviously, too, but <laughs> Sometimes CPU, if, if they get in the way, uh, I don't want them to waste their time basically just by being a glorified uh, middleman that pass things around and, and just sit in between people. Um, so then I want to, to clearly define what is an address space before I, I go much more inside what, what is the purpose of these talks. So an address space is really just a mapping between a virtual address, and uh, which is a pointer inside your program. When you do malloc, you get a pointer out of malloc. When you do mmap of something, you get a pointer out of it. A pointer is just a virtual address. And the virtual address has a mapping with physical memory, so you know, like your program never really knows what kind of physical memory is accessing to. Your program just get virtual addresses and just use that. Your program is fully unaware about the mapping between the virtual address and the physical memory that is being used. And in fact, on, on most operating system, that mapping can evolve during the lifetime of the program. So you know, you you start with the same virtual address. At one point, is using this physical memory, and sometimes later on, the operating system has been doing some other stuff, and for some reason, you are using different physical memory for the same virtual addresses. And it's just the operating system that is doing stuff in the background, and you don't have no control from that on, on that front inside your program, besides some Cisco. But let's ignore them for for the purpose of these talks. <coughs> So each program inside your computer has its own address space, basically. So when you start executing a program, you, have, you get your own address space. It means like all the malloc you do, it's not, you, you, know, you don't share any addresses with any other processes on your, on your computers. And you start to sharing. <coughs> so it's really, a, a process is really the outcome of a fork or an exec. And so like you, you can have some kind of sharing between the child and the parents. So you, know, you, can, you can inherit some of the pointers from, from your parents but depends on all the flags you pass around. But the idea is really when you do fork and exec, you get a different address space inside the child and from the, from the parent. You also have CPU threads that everybody is kind, is kind of aware of, and it's really where you see most of the people doing what is, you know, fork is kind of a dying, uh, dying thing from the old uh, Unix days. People are much, much more using threads because thread means you have the same address space across all the threads. So it does mean that all the threads on, you, on your program can exchange data between each other because we have all the same uh, address set bases, so you know, pointers on one thread doesn't mean the same thing inside the other thread, and so on and so forth. Um, and the bottom line here is really that the address space technically on, on, your, on your process is really managed by malloc and free. Malloc allocate virtual addresses and free just, just, just uh, uh, free that uh, virtual addresses. So malloc and free is really what manage the, the, uh, uh, the address spaces. Uh, I'm talking from a C point of view, but you know all the other languages. In, in the end, it's just a C call inside Unix kernel, which is mmap and mmonmap. But you know, from a C language perspective, it's malloc and free. And if you look at C++, it's going to be new and, and so on and so forth. But in the end, it's the same C call that goes inside the same inside the Unix kernel, so it doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> so it knows that we know what an address space is. Let's talk about device address spaces. So when you have a device, it can have its own address spaces that is uh, different from your process CPU address spaces. And this kind of address spaces is obviously managed by different function and you know, uh, depending on which device you use, it's just gonna be uh, some device API malloc something or device API malloc or device, in, device API free and, and so on and so forth. So you know, it's the same thing but a different function and it's kind of painful. So the idea here is you have a, a, an address space on your devices that doesn't match what you have on your CPU. So a pointer on your device doesn't mean the same thing as on your CPU. 
and you know you have this disjunction between the two and so when you have to communicate data from your CPU to your to a GPU for instance you have to to copy from one address space to the other address space and you know it's kind of a it's not that painful when you're doing just, just, just some kind of flat data structure. So you know, an image that is just like an array, basically, or when you're doing, um, um, yeah, matrix vectors and that kind of stuff. It's kind of easy because it's a flat thing. There is no pointer inside it. But it's really, really hard and error prone when you're starting to do that kind of thing, duplication from one address space to the other, when you have a lot of pointers inside the data structure that you are trying to duplicate on the new address spaces. So if, if it's a list or if it's a tree or if it's a graph or you know, anytime you have um, pointers inside the data structure you want to duplicate, it means you have to duplicate every pointers. And I, I want to give you to walk through an example with you, just a very simple example. Um, of duplicating a list inside the device address space. And let's say you, you get a list in the entry, um, and so you first initialize the device, uh, the device pointer for duplicating the list inside the device, uh, device list. So you're gonna go, list for each entry, you're gonna go over all the entry inside your CPU list. And for every entry, you're gonna device API malloc, a new entry inside the device. And then you do not, you're gonna do device name copy to copy the data of your of your on, from your CPU to your device memory address spaces. Then you just initialize the next pointers of, of your single link list. Uh, if you're not the first, uh, the first node in the list, then you know that there was a node before you and then you need to set the next pointer of the previous node, but you need to use the device API point, the device pointer. So you know, you're not talking about the CPU pointer, you, know, you have to, 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 to get the device pointer from that. And so, you know, it's a single list, it's already a lot of codes, and if you have to do that for graph or for any other complex data set, it's really, really error prone and all that. And when you have to debug something, let's say then, and you have to do the reverse when, you, when your GPU is done, for instance. So you launch a computation on the GPU and the GPU might actually change that list. You know, it might remove nodes, it might add stuff, and so on and so forth. And so the list you get at the output of the GPU might be something different. So you might have to do the reverse operation if you want to get the data back inside the list on the CPU. So it's, you, know, you see, it's really, um, well, it's really painful, really, and, and this is the simplest example you can think of, which is point one pointer. So look at your data structure, look at people's data structure when you're doing complex workload, and you will see that they have much more, much more than one pointer for every node inside the graph, and, and it's really becoming really painful. And so then the question becomes, uh, wouldn't it be easier if all the compute device you have on your system can use the same address spaces, which means that they are for, for one pointers, you get the same physical memory across all your devices and they all agree what that pointer points to at every point in time. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's kind of an abuse. Uh, yes, it's definitely easier. You don't have to do any of this copy. You don't have to do device malloc. You don't have to do device copy. You don't have to do, hey, what is the device pointer for that address and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's much easier if, uh, if you don't have to worry about, hey, what is this device address space? What is the CPU, device, CPU address space? And, and try to mix and match all, all of them. It's even worse when you have multiple devices. So I think you know, it's, um, it's kind of an obvious answer. Um, and you, you might think, well, okay, so the solution is there. Um, and it's actually already, you know, we already have that upstream on some, on Nouveau, for instance, on NVIDIA GPU with the open source driver. We have that on, on, some, uh, on some AMD GPU too. Um, so you know, it's something that does work, it does exist upstream, so you like, Okay, so maybe the, the we all said, you know, we, 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 the, the problem is fixed. But there is one other thing we have to take into account is that uh, nobody, we have multiple type of physical memory. Uh, you have your DDR DIMM that you used to have. So, you know, it's your main system memory. It's fast enough, around 60 gigabyte per second, for instance. Uh, <coughs> but you also see a, a new kind of type of memory see, uh, popping up. Uh, on CPU, you can have HBM memory, which is really a, a fast memory. Uh, depending on which CPU you're looking at, it's going to be between 200 and 1 terabyte of, of bandwidth. Um, and you also have device memory. Device, uh, many devices have their own local memories that is also much more, much more faster than, than uh, what you get inside the main memory. Uh, again, the range is, is, you know, can go up to 1 terabyte of, of bandwidth. It's really, really fast. Uh, and here, the issue is that uh, you have a, you know, all your device on the system are interconnected with each other and with the CPU to PCI Express, for instance, which is the most common bus uh, in most systems. And that can be really a bottleneck. So you know that the PCI Express, if you have like a 16 lane of PCI Express on PCI Express 3, is gonna be 32 gigabyte of bandwidth. So it's out the bandwidth of main memory. 
uh, which is kind of slow. Um, so obviously you want to, you know, when you look at that, uh, tell yourself, I want to use the fastest memory, uh, physical memory, um, to back a range of virtual addresses. Remember the virtual addresses is pointing to some physical memory and there is a mapping between the virtual address and the physical memory. Um, and so at any point in time, you want to use the fastest memory possible for whoever is using the work. So you know, if you're on CPU, you want to use the fastest memory from the CPU point of view. If you're on GPU, you want to use the fastest memory from the GPU point of view. And if you're on the FPGA, you want to use the fastest memory from the FPGA point of view, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was talking about at the beginning that uh, uh, you know, uh, the data set can move from one device to the other. So you, know, you start working on the CPU, then you do something else on the GPU, and then you do something else on the FPGA, and then you may maybe you do something else on some network adapter, RDMA, for instance. Um, and so the, the, your data set is not you know, always work on by just one compute unit. It can be work on by CPU, GPU, FPGA, and so on and so forth. And so what is fastest in one point in time it might not be the fastest thing in the next point in time. You know, when you move from CPU, from a CPU point of view, this memory might be faster, and then from a GPU point of view, this other memory is, is faster. And it's just uh, exactly uh, NUMA all over again for people that are familiar with NUMA. NUMA is uh, when you have uh, multiple CPU, uh, usually it used to be CPU socket, but with AMD nowadays it can be CPU on the same die. So you had multiple CPU and they are connected to each other with a bus. And in time, one CPU need to access a memory that is actually, so each memory is tied to one CPU. And when you have one CPU need to access a memory that is tied to another CPU, that, that CPU have to actually go talk to, to the second CPU. And, and this talk obviously takes time in, at, at latency and also is a, a bottleneck because the bandwidth between two CPU is not as fast as accessing the local memory. So um, what it means really to be able to use the fastest memory at any point in time, it means, it means that you have to be able to migrate the physical memory backing of virtual addresses uh, from one type of memory to another type of memory. Um, and you know, it's something we have been doing for NUMA. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, we have a bunch of syscall in API that, we, that does allow you to do that on Linux. And I'm just listing the three we have. Uh, so we have migrate pages, we have morph pages, and we have imbind. Uh, memory bind really, it's, it's binding memory. And I just want to go over each of them and, and look at what they look like. So migrate pages is really, um, it's kind of a big hammer. It's really um, simple, you get the process ID, you, you give it a list of nodes, so you know, uh, max node is just the number of nodes you, you're gonna give them. And you say, okay, I want to go from that node, from that NUMA node to these new NUMA nodes. And it's gonna move all the pages at once from one set of nodes to another set of nodes. So this kind of syscall has been really done because um, when you have NUMA system, sometimes you want to move a process from a set of CPU, some from one set of cores to another set of cores because you're know, trying to load balance your workload across multiple cores. So you, know, you don't want one core to sit idle when you have one core that have a ton of processes doing working on the same cores. So this is kind of a big hammer. Um, and for the kind of workload I was talking about, you know, when you have something running on CPU, something running on GPU and all that happening concurrently, multiple thread and so on and so forth, you obviously don't want to migrate the whole process that uh, data set from one thing to the other. You just want to, to migrate range of your virtual addresses. Uh, the range that is work on GPU, you want it to move to the GPU, and the range that work on FPGA, you want it to move to the FPGA fastest memory. Um, so it's not the one we're looking to, we want to have. The next one is move pages. So again, you give a process ID, and you, you give a list of, uh, of virtual addresses. Pages is actually a list of virtual addresses. And you say, I want to migrate every single addre virtual addresses, and it's just one page at a time. I want to move them to this new, to this new set of nodes. And so it does move individual pages, and so it's really, you know, it's highly flexible. You can, uh, you can say, I want to move that pages and that other pages and, and that pages, and I want to move them there. Um, the issue is that the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, data set we're looking into nowadays is really big. You know, we, we're talking about images and all that that can take multiple gigabytes of memory. And we're talking about, you know, when you do uh, uh, inference in AI, your data set input is usually in multiple gigabytes, you know, 32, 64 gigabytes. So it's a lot of, lot of pages, really. And so if you look at how much pages you have to move just for one gigabyte, it's, it's a staggering amount. And so if every time you have to you have to build this array of pages, pointers, for every time you want to move a gigabyte of memory. It's a long and, and, and time-consuming thing to do on the CPU. Um, and yeah, cherry picking is really, uh, it's really not efficient. It's not, so it doesn't look exactly what, what we want to do. 
The last one is, is memory bind. Um, so this one takes virtual addresses, um, the size. So it, you, know, you, just, you just basically say, I want to run that branch of virtual addresses. And then I want to, to move that branch to this set of nodes. So the node mask is actually a, a bitmap. And every time you set a bit inside that bitmap, it means that that node that corresponds to that bit is one of the memories of where you, you might want to move that, that, that memory. Um, <coughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's much more what looks like what we want to do. So you, we, we want to be able to range, range of your shoulder address to a set of, one, of, of nodes. Really looks quite close to, to, to what we want to achieve uh, to be able to migrate memory to, to device memory. Um, there is few, uh, few gotcha with that one. Um, one of the thing is that when, when you move to, to some device memory, this device memory is a constraint resource. You know, you might have like 16 gigabytes of device memory, but your main memory is one terabyte of memory, and your data set might not fit inside the device memory, and also you might have other processes using the device memory. So, you know, um, when you run program, it's all about sharing resources across, across the board. Um, and so what you really want to be able to do, you want to be able to have an order list of, uh, of preferences where to move your memory. You say, hey, for this one virtual address, I would like first to use this fastest memory for the GPU. And you know that the second, second fastest memory is gonna be that one. And so you say, well, try this one first. If you run out of, of the first one, try this other second physical memory. And if you run out of, of a second one, try the third one. You know, you have this kind of a fallback list where you say, I want to go first try to use the fastest one and then the second fastest and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, the node mask thing is kind of a wasteful thing because it doesn't give you an order, it's just a bitmap. They just say, this is a list of things where you can migrate memory, but it's not an order list. You don't know which one is the, the preferential one. Um, so, um, another issue we have is that um, Node is really a NUMA concept, and Node is really tied to CPU and CPU core and CPU socket, is for historical reason, because that's, you know, that's where NUMA is start. So um, a node completely failed to capture the complexity you find inside a node. So when you have a CPU, your CPU might be connected to multiple devices. You know, on, you know if you just look at your desktop or your laptop, it's just one NUMA node, basically. And you have, you know, you have your uh, GPU, you have, uh, your sound card, you have your network, you have your Wi-Fi controller, and so on and so forth. And inside each node, you also have different kind of memory. So you have your CPU main memory, your DDR DIMM. You also have your CPU HBM memory, so it's on, on stack on top of your CPU. Uh, you could have uh, a person of memory that what we're seeing uh, uh, popping up now. Uh, and personal memory is kind of a memory that is slightly slower than the main memory, uh, but it's much bigger usually. So you know you can easily get uh, one terabyte DIN. Uh, of percent memory. Um, so, you know, instead of, of giving a node, basically, we want to, to be able to specify your physical memory directly. We don't want to say, hey, this node. We want to say inside that node, this physical memory. So we want to be able to point out the exact uh, physical memory and not just an overall node where there is many, many different things inside the node. Um, so what, what we really want, at least from my point of view, uh, is this kind of syscall. So the, the name really is, can be anything. I, I don't mind the naming. So it's exactly like mBind pretty much. So you give a virtual addresses, you give a size, and then you give the, the mode really. So you, you, the mode is a, a kind of flag, so, so you can, it really doesn't matter, but it's same thing as, as a mBind as a, as a mode argument too. Um, and then you, list, you, you give a list of order list of physical memory IDs that where you want to actually migrate the thing. Um, and that list is, is just, so you say, the first entry in the list is the first one you want to migrate the range. So you know, this is really the one you want to use. And the second one is like, well, if you run out of the first one, try to allocate on the second one. And if you run out of the second one, try to allocate on the third one, and so on and so forth. Um, so you know, it's, um, it, it's, it can also be a replacement for mBind, really, because it, it really can do the same thing as mBind. And usually when you have mBind and when you look at the mBind syscall and you, if you do a system trace on most of the um, many workloads, you will see that uh, mBind usually have a node mask with only very few bit sets. So the size of the phys physical memory ID will be really small. Because most of the time, you know, people, they don't, they don't go and do mBind and try to use all the nodes. Basically, they just say, go do mBind. I'm going to use this and this node, you know, only like a, a handful of nodes, basically. Um, so this is really what I want to get at. This is the kind of syscall I would like to get inside the Linux kernel, but to be able to do a, 
physical memory integration. Um, and one thing that is missing here uh, is we need to be able to identify the physical memory, uh, which includes also device memory. Um, and what we have today inside the Linux kernel, uh, so we have like this directory where you can look at ID for, uh, for NUMA uh, system, basically. So it's a sys device system memory. Uh, it's kind of break, sadly. So you will get a file, an ID, for every 128 megabytes of memory on x86. So it means if you have like a, a, a 64 gigabyte, you will have a 512 uh, uh, ID for the 64 gigabyte, but that 64 gigabyte is the same kind of memory, so you know, it's kind of a waste to have so many ID for the same memory. It's a, it was done for some weird MM reason, and at a time it looks like a good ID, but I think everybody at kind of right agrees it was really the, one of the worst thing we did. Um, so, and also there is another thing to, to know about is that we have a lot of existing program running today, and this program look inside, inside that directory, and we look at the ID inside that directory, and we expect that this ID match memory with some kind of expectation, which is like the memory is cache around, the memory can do atomics, the memory can do so on and so forth. You know, it's your main memory, so people have been used to have this main memory, can do all these kind of things. The thing with device memory is that the device memory might not actually have the same memory model as your main memory, uh, for instance, device memory might not be cache coherent. So that means that when the CPU does, does access the device memory, it cannot do cache coherency. You don't have any cache coherency. Obviously, from a CPU thread point of view, it's really kind of a, you know, it kind of break your programming model from your C or C++ programming model. Um, and you also have a lot of issue with atomics and so on and so forth. So obviously, if you start to put device memory inside that directory, if you start to put, and you have old programs that are not aware of that, we, we might start to use the device memory and suddenly things will break because the device memory cannot do atomics and cache currency and their program will break in a weird way and we don't understand why and we're gonna complain. So obviously we cannot suddenly not reuse the system, uh, system memory as it is. Uh, we need something new. <coughs> so we need, um, we need some kind of a new, so the way the, the, the thing works inside the kind of for that front is uh, what's called a device driver model. So we need a new device driver model for the physical memory. Uh, and we want something really simple. We want one ID by per type of memory. So you know, if you have 64 gigabyte of uh, of, uh, of DIMM inside your system, we want one ID for that. If you have uh, 30, 32 gigabytes of HBM on your CPU, we want an ID for that. If you have an, another NUMA node with uh, uh, another one terabyte of memory, we want an ID for that, and so on and so forth. So you know, we want an ID per type of memory. Um, and each node can have multiple ID because each node can have multiple type of memory. You know, one node with HBM, DR, persistent memory, and also uh, it's the same for device. So when you have a device that is inside a node uh, uh, attached to a CPU, you know, that device also itself can have HBM, can have GDR, can have persistent memory, and so on and so forth. Um, so you know, we want some kind of new directory. So again, the naming, I don't care about the naming really. Um, and inside, so inside that directory, what you have is one file for every device, every memory, every physical memory. Uh, the, the name of the file is just the ID, actually. Um, and inside, inside that, that, that thing, you get a link to the node. So the node, so one of the things is that um, every CPU is on the node and every device is on the node because every device is connected to a CPU. So you always have these kind of links between the two. Uh, and you also, if the, if the memory you're looking at is also a memory from a device memory, then you also want to have a link to the device so you know, hey, this memory belongs to that device. You want to be able to uh, know what kind of connection. And you can also want, definitely want to have a bunch of information, like what is the bandwidth, what is the latency, so you can compare. So you know, when you have two memory um, on the device and you want to be able to know, hey, which is the fastest, what, what is, this one is, is the uh, lowest latency, this one is the fastest, and so on and so forth. So you want to have this kind of formation available to the application. So this is what, this is the two thing I really want to get to. Uh, and that's be, I've been working on that and posting a bunch of patches about around that topics. Uh, so you know, two things is a new syscall and that new syscall need a bunch of new IDs. And so the IDs, the ID side of thing is that thing. So you know, a new, new directory with, uh, with physical memory ID and the other syscall to be able to uh, migrate memory. Um, and that's really um, all I have on that front. And what I want to ask is like anybody against that I think or? Um, just on the last bit of the device memory. I, that, that seems 
fine when you've got something static. What happens if a device disappears? Do you like <coughs> have I if I'm an application and I've read my sys device's memory ID list and I've decided I want to use these IDs and then the device disappears? How do I find that? Out? Like, is there going to be do you have a notification method or something that tells me when new memory IDs appear or some of the ones you're using disappear? Because I could see if a user space process reading this once. Yep. traveling along on its way and then finding out in like four days that the graphics card went away and then trying to still use it and getting you know, inval or, or you know. Just yeah, so, so right now we have the same issue with uh, the existing directory of the XMCFS, so you can have the file that match uh, 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 DDRD uh, disappear under you and sadly you can, the same ID can be reused for a new CPU circuit that can pop up at the different places for different, for different memory. So there is already this issue, but we can use a bunch of file system Cisco where you know you get a file event whenever the file goes away. Um, so you know there is ish, there is a way to fix that from from a file system point of view. Um, it's not fully hooked up. Last time I checked. Uh, so right now I don't think I don't think you got a signal when uh, when inside system memory when one of the device goes when one of the directory goes away. I think there is no signal right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I'm, I'm more worried about establishing a new order where we just let people write applications that assume it's static because they will if it is and if they're not given an upfront way to check they'll they'll write the first you know five years of applications will all be dealing with it as static and all the yeah so, so like my, my solution to that is to never recycle ID so you, when yeah. you give an ID that ID will never be used again so you know it was used once for that physical memory but it will never be used again so that you know if you got a syscall from an application that uses that ID you say well you you have an old view of the world but I'm yeah. just going to ignore it. How do you, yeah, like, have, making sure that there's some defined error code that you're returning saying your idea of the world is bad, please look at it again? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah defining the, the binding error codes, I suppose, to be a bit more than just Ian Val. <laughs> yeah, like something. So, so yeah, so, so one, uh, one of the Cisco, actually, this, this one, uh, this one, morph pages, uh, so the status array basically gives you a bunch of status about what, what was the, re the end result of the migration. So we can have the same kind of thing, basically they say, hey, this is a list of things that can happen and here, here is what happened in the end. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for your research. Uh, now, Listening to that, I'm returning to the early days of the microcontrollers where we had uh, separate memory spaces for uh, flash, for uh, on-chip RAM, for external RAM, for whatever it was. So from this point of view, the situation here seems very similar. That is because uh, when, when the memory spacing was designed, uh, there was were even no idea about PCIe, for example, where uh, your endpoint device may become bus master and uh, request to transfer memory. Nowadays, it seems that we need significant change, as you say. Uh, the problem that I see uh, at first is, for example, the PCI devices, which has uh, limited uh, memory window configured through the base address register so they cannot see the whole memory of the system. They would need to continue assistance from the uh, microprocessor uh, uh, programming the base address register to be able to see the memory which they want to see. So, so, so you're talking about the device accessing the main memory? Yeah. So that's actually, uh, there is no, uh, so it's only the other way around. It's when the CPU access the device memory, then you have the PCI Express bar. The other way around is always, um, it's called um, um, uh, TLP, TL, TLD, so it's a packet. So the PCI Express is a packet protocol, so it's kind of a network actually. So when the device wants to access main memory, it sends a packet to the CPU. That packet has a virtual, has an address, a, a device bus address actually, and that address can be translated by an IOMMU, if you have an IOMMU, if you don't. Yeah. If you have an IOMMU, if you don't have an IOMMU, and if you want, so basically if you want to be PCI Express compliant, device can uh, must be able to access any any physical addresses yeah it has to be able to access any particular addresses but it should have programmed the base address register before mm. that right no that's the other way around the base address register is when it is when the cpu is setting up the pci express bar so it's when you're going from cpu trying to access a device memory 
But if you're going from the device, which is, can be anything, so the device wants to access main memory, then it goes from, from the device to the CPU. And in that other direction, if you are PCI Express compliant, PCI Express free compliant, I think, it's, it's monetary with PCI Express free, I think, um, then you need to be able to access any physical memory. Okay. Uh, so basically, we really need uh, such effort. And I think the embedded uh, people will also appreciate it uh, greatly because the, there are a lot of bus scaling issues, uh, bandwidth calculation uh, done in the embedded world, which highly relates uh, to the memory buses. So the, the issue with bandwidth, so when you report a bandwidth number, uh, you know, it's a best case bandwidth really because, you know, other things might be happening on the bus, multiple devices might be trying to access the same memory and so on and so forth. So when you report a bandwidth of any links between, between any kind of, of two device, CPU or, or device or two device together, it's a best case scenario. So what you're telling the people uh, in, in the best case, if you are the only one using that for sources, that's the best thing you might be able to, uh, to achieve. So I don't know if it answered what. Yeah, yeah, just this work will be appreciated by them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I believe, you know, I'm not doing that because I think it's cool. I believe that there is a lot of people that would like to see something like that. And what I really want to get at is like, do, you, do people like this Cisco? And, and, you know, do you like that kind of Cisco? And do you, do you like also to be able to new, have a new way to identify every physical memory on your system? Because right now there is no way to identify a physical memory, like no common way. So you know, if you want to know the, if you want to use some GPU memory, you will have to use to this GPU driver, and if you want to use this FPGA, you will have to use to talk to this FPGA driver. And every every driver have, have its own API, its own OSTL, and so on and so forth. So you know, you have to 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 learn to speak 10, 20, 50 languages before being able to use all these devices together. And what I want you to, to go. To, to, to have it's some kind of Cisco that say hey, this is a common language for everybody and if you want to talk with everybody you have these common languages and people can you know they don't have to program don't have to learn about all the languages basically. Uh, Jerome should you take a vote? <laughs> Thank you. I know you're gonna hate me for this um, <laughs> so this is fine if you're just moving linear memory around but what happens if you have a device who has a tiling access pattern that makes the device memory twice as fast if you use the tiling access pattern? How do you intend to expose something like that? Or so, so you mean tiling from the physical point of view? Or yes, like so the, the, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a video RAM and if you access it linearly, it goes at 1x and if you access it tiled, it goes at 4x. Is that separate physical memory IDs or is that, you know? So, so actually, if you look at mbind, so if you look at mbind, the mode actually have an interleave flag. Uh, so you know you can think about hey, maybe we need a flag for interleave, but the the tiling we have on GPU, like you know the variety of different tiling we have, yeah. and some tiling going to be really good for that data structure, and other tiling going to be good for that thing, and it will depend on the size of the picture or like you know. So, so yeah, I agree with you. The, the the kind of tiling thing is. I do not see how I can fit tiling inside that. And I think it's really kind of specific to the device, but it does not mean that the device by itself, so you know, when you do a, a PM, PM bind, you will have a callback inside the device driver, inside the kernel. And then you can assume that the device driver have some knowledge. So, you know, it's kind of a sideman to do that. I don't know if we want to have really the explicitly here I'm not against having something explicit here, but if I have to explain tiling, GPU tilings to random people, they will just hate me for that. And I was like. But if you have multiple associated buffers, that can be a common GPU for the whole network. You, you mean so like multiple different physical addresses that will get used? Yeah, like today for rendering, you have, uh, for, uh, for Intel rendering, for instance, for you have a scan out buffer with a particular scan out mode. It'll, it'll actually require separate memory spaces uh, of separate buffers uh, to be assigned to the same object effectively. Yeah, so it's not, so here I'm kind of ignoring anything about graphics because graphics has many so corner cases, like the one you just, so, so you know, I don't want to really use that fully for, for graphics. I know that some I thought Vulcan it was Malik for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Malik for everybody but me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so for graphics, I believe like, like Vulcan things, 
uh, will will you know in many cases in Vulkan for texture and so and things that doesn't have this kind of thing you can use that, but very will be corner cases for GPU like scan out buffer, um, the sparse texture on some GPU will not be able to do that and, and you know there will be corner cases where it's, you don't want to use Maddox sadly I wish but but. I think you know it's more like the hardware people need to fix to be able to be to use to do malloc also for scan out buffer, but you know if you they go to talk will. to them, they will, yeah I know it's like they. they <laughs> and, and do you want to try to put some more sophisticated uh, properties in here, uh, like a prop list of what the properties of the memory are instead of just the flags? So so you get the property of the memory from the sysfs directory inside the sysfs directory. So. Yeah, but. You, the, property of how the memory is being used for this particular Oh, operation. okay, so, so yeah, so it's gonna be used for read only, it's gonna be used read mostly, it's gonna be used. The stride, yeah. the tiling pattern. The yeah, so that, that goes back to the tiling thing, you yeah, know. Yeah, it, it, you, you were talking about just using flags. I mean, we've ended up having to go to a list of properties for the memory. Yeah. So more complicated API. The, the issue here is like, you know, trying to sell syscall to people and trying to say this is a generic syscall for any kind of devices. And if we, uh, like the, the the you GPU things the, we you have can is solve the GPU problem. You can solve anybody's problem. Though, yeah, I'm that's sure. true. Yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I can I can actually add properties like exactly what like we have in Duran um, and a list of properties, and then people can pass down a list of properties, and then we have to learn about the properties. And it's something I'm I'm open to, you know. Yeah. It just setting a syscall is really hard, and and if you have to explain every you know you have to explain every argument and what is behind every argument and what is reason behind every argument, so. And at the same time, when once you have the syscall, you know, syscall is frozen in time. So if you don't have everything you need, then, so maybe I should actually go to the hardware and, and have everything we need, at least for GPU and, and say, because the GPU has been around for long enough and they have so many things, we can assume that, you know, they have the most complex example. And if we can address the most complex thing, then we should Surely be able to- that will solve anything that yeah. could potentially- Anything you throw at us, you know, <laughs> we're ready to anything you throw at us, you know. We'll come up with more crazy, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> You know, if it's a list of properties and you have a list of properties, so you can add new properties to the syscall, right. so. Yeah, properties with values is, yeah. And it's so easy to use with uh, uh, security models and function tracing and. Yeah, also. People like that. Yeah, they like so because they can see what they, is happening because you know, right they, now they when like you. like the big arrays of external values so you can, yeah, yeah so the so security model just explodes in your face and. Yeah, because right now, yeah, see. with IOCTL, all the IOCTL to GPU, all the security tools, people be like, we absolutely have no clue what we're doing. And we sometimes we do nasty stuff. Okay, we're about at the end. Let's thank the speaker and uh, good questions and lunchtime.